Are we ready for the final hour of the reading? Yeah. We've made it to hour 23, everybody. We've made it. Just one more story to go. Uh, it's the first chapter of George's book, 10th of December. Uh, the only story left, the only work of fiction that we haven't read aloud. Uh, it's a story entitled Victory Lab. And after this final hour, then, we'll take a brief break, uh, and then we'll be back with some, I'll have some introductory remarks, and George will deliver his keynote address to us. And so, to read the final story and bring to a close our long and joyful marathon, I am pleased to introduce to you a very special guest, a young man whose burgeoning writing career will, I hope, be helped by this big reading break. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. George Saunders. <laughs> Wasn't that crazy? What did that even mean? 
Also, she loved her house across the creek was the Russian church, so ethnic. That onion dome had bloomed in her window since her proof footy days. Also, loved Glad Song Drive. Every house on Glad Song was a Corona Del Mar. That was amazing. <laughs> if you had a friend on Glad Song, you already knew where everything was, and he's a her home. She takes a day around the show, Pondy Bore, on a happy wing, do front roll, hop to your feet, kiss a picture of mom and dad, taking a pennies back in the Stone Ages. When you were that little cutie right there, kiss with a hair bowl bigger than all outdoors. Sometimes feeling happy like this, she imagined a baby deer trembling in the woods. Where's your mom, little guy? I don't know. The deer said in the voice of Heather's little sister, Becca. Are you afraid, she asked Are you hungry? Do you, do you want me to hold you? Okay. The baby deer said, here came the hunter now, dragging the deer's mother by the antlers. Her guts were completely splayed. Jeez, that was nice. She covered the baby's eyes and was like, Don't you have anything better to do, dang hunter, than kill this baby's mom? You seem like a nice enough guy. Is my mom killed? The baby said in the back of the voice, No, no, she said, this gentleman was just leaving. The hunter, captivated by her beauty, doffed her, doffed his cap, and when we got on one knee, said, If I could will like that because it's fall, I would do so. And hoped she might defer one tender kiss upon her elderly forehead. Go, she said, only for your task of penance, do not eat her. Lay her out in a field of clover with roses strewn about her, and be still a choir to softly sing of her foul end. Lay her out, the baby deer said. No, and she said, never mind, stop asking so many questions. She felt hopeful that special one was, would hail from far away. A local voice possessed a certain je ne sais quoi, which tells the church she was not very crazy about. Such as actually named their own nuts. <laughs> she had overheard that. And inspired to work for county power because the work shirts were awesome and you got them for free. So, Ixnay on the local voice. Special Ixnay on Matt Dre, owner of the largest mouth in the land. Kissing him last night at the time really had been like kissing an underpass. <laughs> Scary. Kissing Matt was like suddenly this cow in a sweater is bearing down on you who will not take home for an answer. And this huge cow head is being flooded by chemicals that are drowning out what little powers of reason Matt actually did have. But she, like, was being in charge of her, her body, her mind, her thoughts, her career, her future. That was what she liked. So be it. We might have a slight snack. Un petit fatal. But she's special. But she considered herself special. Oh gosh, she didn't know. In the history of the world, many had been more special than her. Helen Keller had been awesome. <laughs> Mother Teresa was amazing. Mrs. Roosevelt was quite, quite chipper, in spite of her husband, who was handicapped. Which, in addition, she had been gay with those big old teeth. Long before such times being gay and first lady was even conceptual. She, Allison, could not hope to compete in the category of those ladies. Not yet, anyway. There's so much you didn't know, like how to change the hood. Or even check the hood. How to open the hood. <laughs> how to make brownies. That was embarrassing, actually, being a girl and all. And what was a mortgage? <laughs> did it come with the house? <laughs> when you breastfed, do you have to, like, push the milk out? You guess who was this wan figure visible through the living room window trotting on the on the drive? Kyle Boot, palest kid in all the land, still dressed in his weird cross country toggles. Poor thing. He looked like a skeleton with a mullet. Were those cross country shorts from like Charlie's Angel days or claw? How could he run so well when he seemed to have literally no muscles? Every day he ran home like this, shirtless with his backpack on, and hit the remote from down by the phones and Scooted into his garage without breaking the stride, yet you almost had to admire the poor roof. They'd grown up together in little beaners in that mutual sandbox down by the creek. And they bathed together when we of some such crud. She hoped that never got out. Because in terms of friends, Kyle was basically down to 
Fanny slumped over. He walked even way backward and was always retrieving things from between his teeth, announcing the name of the retrieved thing in Greek, then re-eating it. And Kyle's mom and dad didn't let him do squat. He had to call home if the movie and world culture might show bare boobs. Each of the items in his lunchbox was clearly labeled Pondivore and Curtsy, or a quantity of cheese noodles in the compartment of my old school Tupperware DVD. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Dad. The kitchen rocks. She had Tupperware DVD back and forth like paying for gold, then offered us some imaginary poor gathered around. Please enjoy it. Is there anything else I can do for you folks? You've already done enough, Allison, but you didn't deign to speak to us. <laughs> That's so not true. Don't you understand? All people deserve respect. Each of us is a rainbow. Oh, really? Look at this big open sore on my poor shriveled flank. <laughs> Allow me to fetch you some Vaseline. That would be much appreciated to stay kills. But as far as everybody here, yeah, she believed that. People were amazing. Mom was awesome. Dad was awesome. Her teachers worked so hard and had kids of their own. And some were even getting divorced, such as Mrs. D's, but still always took time for their students. What she found especially inspiring about Mrs. Deese was that even though Mr. Deese was cheating on Mrs. Deese with the lady who ran the bowling alley, Mrs. Deese was still teaching the best course ever in ethics. <laughs> Posing such questions as, can goodness win? <laughs> or, or, do good people always get shafted? <laughs> Evil being more reckless. That last bit seemed to be Mrs. Deese taking a shot at the bowling alley, but seriously, is life fun? Or scary? Are people good or bad? On the one hand, that clip of those gauntish pale bodies being steamrolled while fat German ladies looked on the chomping gum. On the other hand, sometimes rural folks, even if their particular farms were on hills, stayed up late filling sandbags. In their stronghold, she had voted for people being good and life being fun, with Mrs. Dees giving her a, a pitying glance as she stated her views, which were to do good, you just have to decide to do good. You have to be ready. You have to stand up for what's right. At that last, Mrs. Dees had made this kind of groan, which was fine. Mrs. Dees had a lot of pain in her life, and interestingly, still obviously found something fun about life and good about people. Because otherwise, why sometimes stay up so late grading? You come in the next day all exhausted, blouse on backward, and you mess it up in the early morning, dark, you dear, discombobulated thing. Here came a knock on the door. Back door. Interesting. Who could it be? Father Dimitri from across the way? You guess FedEx with Lunatine Check Pop Pop? Jete, Jete, Ron Jean. Todd Gray. Open door and it was a man she did not know. Quite huge fellow in one of those meter rear vests. Something told her to step back in, slam the door, but that seemed rude. Instead, she froze, smiled, did eyebrow raise to indicate, May I help you? I'll get it. Next door, Kyle Boot dashed through the garage into the living area where the big clock like wooden indicator was set at all out. Other choices included mom and dad out, mom out, dad out, Kyle out. Mom and Kyle out, Dad and Kyle out, and all in. Why did they even need all in? <laughs> Wouldn't they know it when they were all in? Or would you like to ask Dad that? Who in his excellent, uh, totally silent downstairs which I had designed and built the family status indicator? Ha, ha, ha. On Kitchen Island was a work notice from Dad. All scout, new geode on deck, place in yard for included drawing. No goofy, right here, your first put down plastic as I have shown you. Then laying white rock. This geo expensive. Please take seriously. No reason this should not be done by the time I get home. This equal five, five, four points. God, Dad. Do you want to see you very much have to sleep in the dark until sleep in the yard until dark after a rigorous cross country practice that included 16440s, 80 80s, a mile for time, and cajillion drink strings on a five mile painting relay? Shoes off, Mr. You ain't too late, he's already at the TV. And they left an incriminating trail of microclots way you were holding them. Could the microclots be hand plucked? Well, the problem, if you went back to hand pluck the microclots, you'd leave an incriminating new trail of microclots. 
he took off his shoes and stood mentally rehearsing a little show we like to call, What If Right Now? <laughs> what if they came home right now? And that's a funny story, Dad. I can't even follow this. So then realize what I've done. I guess when I think about it, what I'm happy about is how quickly I saw correct. The reason I came so thoughtfully was I wanted to get right to work yet, per your note. He raised his socks to the garage, threw his shoes into the garage, ran for the vacuum, vacuumed up the microclots, and realized, holy golly, he had thrown his shoes into the garage rather than replacing them on the shoe sheet. That required toes facing away from the door for ease of dominance later. He stepped into the garage, raised his shoes on the shoe sheet, stepped back inside. Oh, Scott, Dad said in his head. Has anyone ever told you that even the most neatly maintained garage is going to have some oil on this floor? Which is not on your socks. Being trapped all over the tamper. Oh, God, his ass with her ass. But no, Sal, I'll break the times. Come on, no oil stain on the rug. He tore off his socks. It was actually for both for him to be in the main living area barefoot. Mom and Dad, coming home to find a Tarzan hanging around like some sort of white trasher, <laughs> it would not be the least fucking bit. All swearing in your head? <laughs> Dad said in his head. Step up, Scout, be a man. If you want to swear, swear a lot. <laughs> I, I don't want to swear a lot. Then don't swear in your head. <laughs> Mom and Dad would be heart sick if they could hear the swearing he sometimes did in his head. Just crack on shit turd, get in here, butt prairie, why don't we stop doing that? <laughs> they felt so highly of them, sending weekly braggy emails to both sets of grandparents, such as. Kyle has been super busy keeping up his grades while running varsity cross country, though still a sophomore, while setting aside a little time each day to manufacture such humdinger as this. Cut swaddle, rip up! Hold on, Why could he be grateful for all that mom and dad did for him instead of carnal deer hunt? Fight fuck the pale veteran with a father and dignity! He always clear the mind of the hard pinch on her own minimal well handle. Ouch! Hey, today was Tuesday. A major treat day. Five new work points for placement with you, plus his existing two work points, totaled seven work points, which added to his eight accrued usual short points made 15 total treat points, which could garner him a major treat. For example, two handfuls of yogurt covered raisins, plus 23 choice TV minutes. Although the particular show would have to be negotiated with Dad at the time to cash in. All one thing you'll not be watching, Scout, is America's most outspoken dirt bikers. <laughs> whatever. Whatever, Dad. Oh, really, Scout? Will it be whatever when we take away all your tree points and force you to quit cross country, as I've several times threatened to do, a little more cheerful obedience wasn't forthcoming? <laughs> no, no, I don't want to quit, Dad. I'm good at it. You'll see. Even Matt Dre said, mm, and who's Matt Dre? Some ape on the football team. Yes. Is his word law? What did he say? Little shit came run. Nice talk, Scott. Eight talk. Anyway, you may not make it to the first meet. Your ego seemed to be overflowing into banks. And why? Because you can jog. Anyone can jog. Beast of the field can jog. I'm not quitting anal hot shit or reckon fresh. Please, I'm begging you. It's only going to be sent home. If he makes me quit, I swear to God, I'll. Drama doesn't suit you, beloved only. Well, if you want the privilege of competing in a team sport, Scout, show us that you can live within our perfectly reasonable system of directives designed to benefit you. Hello? The man just pulled up in the same hotel's parking lot. Kyle walked in a controlled, gentlemanly manner to the kitchen counter. On the counter was Kyle's traffic log, which served the dual purpose of one, buttressing Dad's argument that Father Dimitri should build a soundproof retaining wall, and two, constituting a data set for a Possible science verified for him, Kyle, entitled by Dad, Correlation of Church Parking Lot Volume versus Day of the Week. <laughs> An ancillary investigation of Sunday volume throughout the year. Smiling agreeably as he enjoyed filling out the log, Kyle very legibly filled out the log. Vehicle, van, color gray, made Chevy, year unknown. The guy got out of the van, one of the usual whiskeys. First he was not allowed to slang. Also dang. Also holy golly. Also crap. The Ruski was wearing a jean jacket over a hoodie, which from Kyle's experience was not unusual church wear for the Ruski who sometimes came directly over from Jiffy Lou still wearing coveralls. Under vehicle driver he wrote probable parishioner. 
That's stop stank, rather. The guy being stranger, he, Kyle, now had to stay inside until the stranger left the neighborhood. It was totally fucked up this geo place, and he'd be out here till midnight. What a decorate. Guy put on a day old vest. Ah, dude was a meter reader. The meter reader looked left, then right, leaped across the creek, entered the cold backyard, passed between the soccer water mounder and the in-ground pool, then knocked on the pole door. Could leave there for us. The door swung open. Allison. Kyle's heart was singing. He always thought that was just a phrase. Allison was like a national treasure. In the dictionary under beauty, there should be a picture of her in that jean sport. <laughs> but lately, she didn't seem to like him all that much. Now she stepped across her deck so the meter reader could show her something, something electrical, wrong on the roof. I seemed eager to show her. They actually, he had her by the wrist. I was like, tugging. That, that was weird, wasn't it? Well, something had never been weird around here before, so probably it was fine. Probably the guy was just a really new meter reader. Somehow Kyle felt like stepping out onto the deck. He stepped out. The guy froze. Allison's eyes were scared for his eyes. The guy cleared his throat, turned slightly to let Kyle see something. The knife. The meter reader had a knife. Here's what he's doing, the guy said. Standing right there until we leave. Move a muscle, a knife are right in the heart. I swear to God. Got it. Kyle's mouth was so spitless, uh, all he could do was make his mouth do the shape it normally did when saying yes. Now they were crossing the yard. Allison threw herself to the ground. The guy hauled her up. She threw herself down. He hauled her up. It was so odd seeing Allison tossed like a rag doll in the sanctuary of the perfect yard her dad had made for her. She threw herself down. The guy hissed something and she rose, suddenly docile. In his chest, Kyle felt the many directors, major and minor, he was right now violating. He was on the deck, shoeless. On the deck shirts, was outside when a stranger was near, had engaged with that stranger. Last week, Sean Ball had, had brought a wig to school to more effectively mimic the way Beth Mirren chewed her hair when nervous. Kyle kind had of briefly considered intervening. At evening meeting, uh, Mom had said that she considered Kyle's decision not to intervene judicious. Dad had said, That was not your business. You could have been badly hurt. Mom had said, Take them all their resources and invest in you, little Emily. Dad said, oh, I know we sometimes try to do a strip, but you are literally all we have. They were at the soccer ball around her now, and also an arm behind her back. She was making this low, repetitive sound of denial, like she was trying to invent a noise that would adequately communicate her feelings about what she just this instant realized was going to happen to her. Well, he was just a kid, and there was nothing he could do. In his chest, he felt the lush release of pressure that always resulted when he submitted to a directive. There his feet was the geo. He should just look at that until they left. It was a great one, maybe the greatest one ever. The crystal that the cutaway goes in in the sun. It would, it would look nice in the yard once he placed it. And he placed it once they were gone. Dad would be so impressed that even after what had occurred, he, he remembered to place the geo. That's the ticket scout. We are well pleased, beloved only. Super top, Scott. Holy crap. It was happening. She was marching along all meek like the trooper you know she'd be. He had in her mind since the baptism of what's his name, uh, Sergei's kid at the Russian church. She'd been standing in her yard, her dad was some such taking her picture. He'd been like, hello, Betty. And Kenny had been like, little young girl. He'd been like, for you, Grandpa. When you studied history and the history of cultures, you saw your own individual time as high bound. There were various theories of acquiescence. In Bible days, a king might ride through a field and go, that one. And she would be brought unto him. And they would duly be betrothed, and if she gave birth unto a son, soon would bring out the streamer. She was a keeper. Was she that first night digging it? Probably not. Was she shaking like a leaf? Didn't matter. What mattered was offspring, a furtherance of the lineage, plus the exaltation of the king, which resulted in righteous kingly power. Here was the 
create, you march it through. The following bullet points remain in the decision matrix. Take to side man door, shove in, follow in, tape wrist mouth, hook the chain, make the speech, get the speech down hold. The cracks of the bolt in his head and on the recorder. <clears throat> Calm your heart, darling. I know you're scared because you don't know me yet and didn't expect it today, but give me a chance and you will see we will fly high. See, I'm putting a knife right over here and I don't expect to have to use it, right? If she would get in the hand, punch hard in the gut, then pick up, carry it outside the van door, throw in, tape wrist mouth, hook the chain, make speech, etc., etc. Stop, pause, he said. Gav stopped. Fuck's sake, side door, the van was locked. How one discipline was that? Ensuring that the door was unlocked was clearly indicated on the pre-mission matrix. Melvin appeared in his mind. On Melvin's face with a look of hot disappointment that had always preceded an ass woman, which had always preceded the other thing. Put up your hands, Melvin said, defend yourself. True, true, the lair there, should double-check the pre-mission matrix. No biggie, joy not fear. Melvin was dead 15 years, mom dead 12. Bitch was turning around and looking back at the house. That willfulness wouldn't stand. That was going to get nipped in the butt. He'd have to remember to hurt her early, establish the baseline. Turn the fuck around, he said. She turned around. He unlocked the door, swung it open. Moment of truth. If she got, got in, let me use the tape, they were home free. He picked out a place in sack it. Big, big ass cornfield, brick road leading in. If fuck wise it went good, they'd pick up the freeway from there. Basically, steal the man. It was Kenny's man. He borrowed it for the day. And yeah, screw Kenny. Kenny once called him stupid. Too bad, Kenny. That remark just cost you one man. The fuck by the one bad, she didn't properly arouse him. He aborted the activity. Truncate the subject. Deep the thing out. Clean man is necessary. Go buy corn. Return man to Kenny. Say, hey bro, here's a shitload of corn. Thanks for the van. I never could have bought a suitable quantity of corn in just my car. Then we will watch the papers like he done with that non-arousing redhead out in Gal gave this important look like, please don't. Ah, was this a good time? Give her one that got knocked the wind out of her sails? It was. He did. The Geo was beautiful. What a beautiful Geo. What made it beautiful? What were the principal characteristics of a beautiful Geo? Come on, think. Come on, concentrate. She will recover in time to let her uh, no more fair scholar. We're amazed by your good judgment, Father Emily. Dimly he noted that Allison had been punched. Eyes on the geo, he heard the little oof. His heart dropped at the thought of what he was letting happen. They'd used goldfish snacks as coins. They made bridges out of rocks. Down by the creek. Back in the day, oh God, he should have never stepped outside. Once they were gone, he'd just go back inside, pretend he'd never stepped out, make the model of railroad town. Still be making it when mom and dad got home. When eventually someone told him about it, he'd make a certain face. Already on his face, he could feel the face he would make, like, what? Allison rape killed? Oh my god. Rape and killed by uh, instantly made by railroad town? Sitting cross legged? I don't know on Florida, a tiny little. No, 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 no. They'd be gone soon, then he could go inside, call 911. Although, then everyone would know he'd done nothing. All his future life would be bad forever. He'd be the guy who'd done nothing. He said, Holly would do any good. They, they'd be long gone. The parkway was just across Featherstone with like a million arteries and clover leaves or whatever spouting out of it. So that was that. And he'd go. As soon as they left, leave, 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 he thought, so I can go inside. Forget to separate. Then he was running across the lawn. Oh, God. What was he doing? What was he doing? Jesus. Shit. The directives he was violating. Running in the yard. Bad for the sod. Transporting a geo without its protective wrapping. Hopping the fence, which stressed the fence, which could cost a pretty penny. Leaving the yard. Leaving the yard barefoot. Entering the secondary area without permission. Entering the creek barefoot. Broken glass. Dangerous microorganisms. And not only that, oh, God. Suddenly he saw what this gay part himself intended, which was to violate a directive so major and absolute that it wasn't even a directive, since it didn't need a directive to know how totally verboten it was to. He burst out of the creek, the guy still not turning, and let the geo fly into his head. It seemed to emit a weird, edged of blood, even before the skull visibly indented, and the guy sat right on his ass. Yes, score! It was fun! <laughs> fun, I'm being a grown up. 
fun of using the most dazzling gazelle like flicks we've ever seen in the history of mankind to dash soundlessly across space and master this huge galoot who otherwise right now would be. What if he hadn't? God, what if he hadn't? Imagine the guy bending Allison in two like a pale garment bag while pulling her hair and thrusting bluntly as he, Kyle, sat cowed and obedient, tiny railroad by the grasp of his pathetic biggest Jesus. He skipped over and hurled the geo through the windshield of the van, which imploded, producing an inward rain of glass shards that made the sound of thousands of tiny bamboo wind chimes. He scrambled up and put the van and repeated the geo. Really? Really? You were going to ruin her life? Ruin my life, you cunt, pro, dick munch, ass gashing animal? Who's bossing who now? Gash ass. Shit lips, turd munch. He never felt so strong, angry, wild. Who's the man? Who's your daddy? What else must he do to ensure that animals didn't know further harm? You still a movie freak? Got a plan to stroke deck? Want a skull bash on top of your existing skull bash, big man? You think I won't? You think I. Oh, easy, skull, so you're on control. Slow your motor down, boy, only. Quiet, I'm the boss of me. Fuck. What the hell? What was he doing on the ground? Had he tripped? Did someone walk him? Did a branch fall? God damn. He touched his head. His hand came away, buddy. The beanpole kid was bending to pick something up a rock. Why was that kid off the porch? Where was the knife? Where is the gal? Crap crawling toward the creek, flying across her yard, going into her house. Fuck it, everything was fucked. Better hit the road with what? It's good looks, he had an eight bucks total. Ah, Christ, now the kid had smashed the windshield with the rock. Kenny was not going to like that one bit. He tried to stand but couldn't. The blood was just pouring out. He was not going to jail again. No way. He slit his wrists. Where was the knife? He stabbed himself in the chest. That had no ability. Then the people would know his name. Which of them had the balls to samurai themselves with a knife in the chest? None. Nobody. Go ahead, proceed. Do it. No. The king does not take his own life. The superior man silently accepts the minus rebuke of the rabble. Waits to rise and fight anew. Plus, he had no idea where the knife was. Well, he didn't need it. He crawled into the woods. Kill somebody with his bare hands. Or make a trap from some grass. Ugh, was he gonna barf? There he had, right on his lap. Figures you go the simplest thing, Melvin said. Oh my god, can't you see my head is bleeding so bad? I can't get it to you, you're a joke. You gotta fuck my kid. Oh, all sirens, perfect. Well, it was a sad day for the cops. He'd fight him hand to hand. He'd sit until the last moment, watching them draw near Luna. A silent death mantra would centralize all his life power in his fists. He sat thinking about his fists. They were huge granite boulders. They were a pit bull each. He tried to get up. Somehow his legs weren't working. He hoped the cops would get here soon. His head really hurt. When he touched up there, things moved. It was like he was wearing a gore cap. He was going to need a bunch of stitches. He hoped it wouldn't hurt too much. Probably would go. Where was that beanpole kid? Oh, here he was, looming over and blocking out the sun, rock held high, yelling something, but he couldn't tell what because of the ringing in his ears. And he saw that the kid was going to bring the rock down. He closed his eyes and waited and was not at peace at all, but instead felt the beginnings of a terrible dread welling up inside him. And if that dread kept growing at the current rate, he realized in a flash of insight there was a name for the place he would be then, and it was hell. Allison stood at the kitchen window. She peed herself, which was fine. People did that. I was super scared. She noticed it won't make them call. Her hands had been shaking so bad. They still were. One leg was doing that thumper thing. God, the stuff he'd said to her. He, he punched her. He pinched her. It was a big blue mark on her arm. How, how could Kyle still be out there? But there he was in those comical shorts. So common, he was goofing around. Hands clenched over his head like a boxer from some cute all universe where a kid that skinny could actually win a fight against a guy with a knife. Wait, his hands weren't clenched. He was holding the rock, shouting something down at the guy who was on his knees, like that blindfolded prisoner in the video they'd seen in history. 
about to get a sword killed by a formal dude named Helmet. Kyle, don't know, she whispered. For months afterwards, she had nightmares in which Kyle brought the rock down. She was on the deck trying to scream his name, but nothing was coming out. Down came the rock. Then the guy had no head. The, the blow just literally dissolved his head. Then his body tumbled over, and Kyle turned to her with this heartbroken look of, My life is over. I killed the guy. Why was it, she sometimes wondered, that in dreams we can't do the simplest things, like when you know, a crying puppy is standing on some broken glass, and you want to pick it up and brush the shards off its pads, but you can't because you're bouncing a ball in her head. Or you're driving, and there's this old guy, and crushes, and you go to Mr. Fader, your driver's head teacher, should I swerve? And he's like, oh, probably. <laughs> but then you hear this big clunk, and Fader makes a negative mark in his book. Sometimes she'd wake up crying from the dream about Kyle. The last time Mom and Dad were already there, going, it's not how it was. Remember, Natalie? How did it happen? Say it. Say it out loud. Ellie, can you tell Mommy and Daddy how it really happened? Uh, I ran outside, she said. I shouted. That's right, Dad said. You shouted. Shouted like a champ. And what did Kyle do? Mom said. You put down the rock, she said. A bad thing happened to you, kids, Dad said. But it could have been worse. So much worse, Mom said. But because of you, kids, Dad said. It wasn't. You did so good, Mom said. Did beautiful, Dad said. Thanks.